If you have listened to the Intentional Clinician podcast before, you might have heard in the ending notes a little something about the National Violence Prevention Hotline. This is a 501c3 organization that I started some years ago. The initial idea came to me in 2018. We have an entire website, violencepreventionhotline.org, where you can learn more, you can write your local representatives, you can look into resources, and you can donate if you want to. Today's episode is just a mini episode because I've been getting more and more interest from the public, both people reaching out looking for violence prevention resources um, and also people that are looking to possibly try to help me turn this into something larger. We aren't trying to necessarily be separate from 988, but we do believe 988, which has morphed from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is now the crisis line, which is a good step, I believe. But there is no advertising that I have found directing to potential perpetrators or the family members or people around potential perpetrators. Mostly they are advised to call the police or um, crisis teams and um, people want more than that. And also, if there are people out there isolated looking to commit violent acts, that they are needing resources and someone to talk to before going to the police, a lot of them avoid the police. So recently I sat down with NBC12 in Phoenix and they were interviewing me about the National Violence Prevention Hotline as they were doing an entire series on community violence in uh, the Phoenix, Arizona area as there had been uh, an uptick of violence in the suburbs and in the um, city amongst uh, youth. So I did a lot of speaking with them uh, and I recorded it myself, not really on a professional microphone, but uh, you can hear what we said unedited. Uh, as they ask some great questions, I believe, and it's a short interview. I believe they're going to use some clips of it in some of their upcoming programming, but they allowed me to record it for myself, and uh, I'm now going to let you listen to it. So if you want to get involved, if you want to know more, stay tuned for this interview about violence and mental health, and um, check out violencepreventionhotline.org. All right, thanks so much for listening. Okay, so yeah, the national, so the national suicide prevention. I said suicide. That's okay. I'm so used to no, that. I'm so sorry. The national violence no, no. prevention. No, no. I just want to distinguish for your for your reporting. The national so suicide sorry. prevention yes. lifeline is now cu- turning into the crisis hotline right. at nine eight eight. Yes. And that's been around since the early two thousands or late nineties, but it used to be a bunch of hotlines before that. But yes. What we what I have been proposing and with the board of directors is the national violence prevention hotline, mm-hmm. which could be possibly an extension off the crisis hotline or its own thing. Mm-hmm. And essentially what this is, is this is a hotline exclusively for anyone who is feeling like they want to become violent in the future or are feeling uh, acutely homicidal um, and don't know what to do. And so we are trying to reach out and we are not trying to be in denial that this isn't an issue in society. It's a major issue in society, and it happens all around the world. Uh, but in the U.S. is where we're starting this, or trying to start this. And essentially, we believe that when humans are stressed out and upset or going through different things in life, that one of the coping skills, instead of hurting yourself or you know eating food or whatever or drinking alcohol, is actually violence. And that we feel in a point of our lives, some people feel that the solution to their problems is uh, revenge or violence against someone or an institution or somebody who represents something that they're angry about. And anger is a, a real thing that we all feel. And so while society has done a great job in the last 20 years and the government and the nonprofits working on the issue of suicide and bullying, done a great job with that because those things have been happening forever. But we finally said, let's formalize the discussion. Let's have resources. Let's make a a phone tree. You know, the suicide hotline, of course, dumps to different sort of local crisis providers, the police, hospitals, social workers, all of that. 
to uh, counselors and therapists and schools are doing that as well. But we don't have something that is explicitly saying, if you feel violent, we are going to try to help you and treat you like a person. A lot of people that feel violent are afraid to come out and say that because if you tell your doctor or your therapist, they may say, oh, who are you going to be violent against, right? And then we have the Tarasov law, which means that they may have to actually break confidentiality and report you. And or let's say you didn't have a specific target, they may now be scared of you, right? They may be judging you. Your friends might think that you are out of your mind and may kind of push you away or they might call the police, right? And if you call the police and say you're going to be violent, they don't always respond with a gentle hand because they may be worrying that you, this is a trap for them or you're a dangerous individual, which you could be, right? But you, this, is, this hotline is, the National Violence Prevention Hotline is attempting to have a resource for people that are angry and feeling like they want to be violent or commit homicide before they go into the action stage. We're trying to catch them in the planning stage, right? Mm -hmm. So the difference is with domestic violence, which there is a domestic violence hotline for victims, and we have heard of some people calling that line who are actually people that would be called perpetrators. Um, in those situations, often domestic violence is an escalation, right? And people kind of maybe call names back and forth, or they have resentments, and then eventually it culminates into violence. But often, not often, but a decent amount of the time, it's not really planned out, right? Same with bar fights or, uh, you know, you're at the waste management open and somebody yells at you and you get angry and punch them in the face because you're out, you're drunk. Okay. That's, that's not what we're doing here. This is, this is for people that might be more isolated or they maybe got fired from a job. They're really angry. They don't know what to do. They don't feel suicidal. Instead, they feel homicidal, violent. I need to, I need to get rid of this emotion and I'm, I'm going to get revenge. Um, so that's, that's what it's aiming at. Um, and kind of when you had said, okay, you know what, like this is needed. Can you tell me about that moment and why, um, you think that this could really make a, a, a big difference in the lives of Americans? Well, yes. Um, in one of the lecture on the website, uh, and I can't remember her first name, but her last name is Tuft. There was a lady that worked at a school in Georgia and there was a man, an angry man, that came into the school with guns. And he basically took her hostage, I would say, uh, in the schoolroom. And he wanted to enact violence against people. But I think he was scared. He was still not completely over the edge of acting. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the police surrounded the school. They shut down the school and locked all the doors. And he, she was in there with him. And she started telling him she loved him. And that she wanted to be there for him and that she could see that he was in a lot of pain and she was praying for him and she wanted to help. And he eventually agreed to put down his gun and he was crying and she was crying. And he, he said, I don't want to be shot by the police. And uh, well, at first he did want to shoot the police and he wanted the police to kill him because he was so angry. Right. He's suicide and homicidal can sometimes go together. And eventually, uh, he calmed down enough for her to call the police, and the police did not hurt him. They just arrested him. Um, and he eventually got help, and no one was harmed. And that made me think, in society, whenever we hear about somebody who's been violent, um, I hear a lot of responses. I'm not saying there's one or two, but the two responses I hear are, oh my gosh, we had no idea our neighbor was harboring um, violent tendencies and would go to his work and shoot people, okay? We had no idea. They seemed like such a nice guy, which is one problem. The next problem I hear is we demonize them. Oh, they're just totally psychotic. They are, um, they're, they're not worth our time. We should just lock them up and throw away the key or hopefully we shot them, right? It's these sort of binary reactions uh, that we have. When actually... Um, Many of these people that are violent are savable, so to speak, as citizens, if they get the right intervention. And one would say, well, isn't it up to them to get that intervention? I would say, of course it is, right? But there are people in their lives, there are people around them that notice problems. And this hotline would give the people around them also a hotline 
to call and get advice before going to the police, or maybe the hotline would say, call the police, this is, a, this is a, an emergency. Uh, you need to get them, get them help and get their weapons away or whatever, and or they are feeling so isolated, they don't know who to turn to, violence is a taboo subject, and they call the hotline. That's, that's the idea. The shooter at Michigan State recently, in the last year or so, um, people in his neighborhood had called the police multiple times because he had shot rounds into the air. And he was an adult male, pretty, in his, I think his late 30s or early 40s, living with his one of his parents. And he had a lot of emotional issues. People knew he had problems, but yet he never got help, probably because he didn't know where to get the help. But also people just kind of, they didn't, they weren't forceful enough with it. There's no, where's the resource? It's the police or let's see if we can get him into therapy or something. But people have a right to say no to that. Right. So this would be both a resource of help, but also an information resource. But also it could sound the alarm if we feel like this is a, a, a situation that needs to have intervention. Right. And therefore he went and did what he did and killed innocent people and devastated people's lives. And then he shot himself, right. Right. which shows the self-hatred. Right. right. Absolutely. Um, and as you were talking before, too, I was, you know, we're working a lot on this problem of teen violence yes. know, that we're seeing we've seen it for years it i think just came to a head maybe in gilbert yes um and i think about we we're starting to learn so much more about these teens history yeah the dysfunction that maybe they they are living in the past that they've already gone through mm -hmm. um and getting to kind of this gang style point of attacking others yes calculated oh yeah it seems like this could be something that could help absolutely um another idea of the national violence prevention hotline is to bring the conversation of violence that is happening in our communities no matter what type of community it's happening it's happening all over the u.s bring it into the forefront to discuss it perhaps even establishing local centers where people could work on, you know, having a group about anger, having a group about violence, so that teens and young adults and adults could come together and kind of get help over this. Maybe they don't want to go into traditional therapy. Maybe there's not resources at their school. Maybe there's not resources at their workplace. But a little bit of prevention money goes a long way because cleaning up violence in people's devastated lives costs millions. I mean, if you look at the studies on the effects of violence uh, monetarily, I did that in my lecture that I gave in Chicago, it's incredible versus the amount of funding that it would take to make a, lot, a hotline like this or even start a local center that would help people with their emotional growth. With the situation in Gilbert, there are, I'm sure, plenty of other teenagers around these teenagers that know that something's not going right whether it's at home or at school, who could utilize this hotline as a resource to get help? What do I do? I'm not sure what to do. I don't want to betray them. Maybe they threatened me, right? Um, I don't want to go into a lecture about gangs, but if somebody, if somebody's joining a gang, clearly they're looking for belonging. They're looking for something to be a part of. They're looking, maybe they're, uh, they're trying to find some of their identity. And, but the hard part about that mentality is that if you're in a gang where the, the meaning and the collective, um, you know, partnership among you are, is not about something positive like sports or music or theater or something else teenagers might be into, it can really go dark with that kind of peer influence, right? And so I'm not sure if those situations happen because of escalations, but it did seem planned out. And if it's planned out, this is exactly a resource that not only one of the kids who was in the gang or maybe somebody near them could have called, right? Or maybe one of the kids who was like, well, they've assigned me to do this as my initiation. They might be able to call and get help, but where's the resource? The, the resource is the police. The police are overwhelmed with all sorts of other issues. And they're coming in after the fact to investigate the violence. We're trying to get there before the violence starts. Yeah. And in your um, professional look at, at violence, can you help people understand 
that they're about the run up, that this isn't most of the time just a split second decision. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, for some people, it is sort of a reactionary stance. But I would argue that over time, that person has drifted further and further and further into a mindset where violence is okay and acceptable in their mind. So it didn't happen overnight, even if we see them so supposedly snap. Um, in addiction, we, we talk about if you're going to address the issue, you, you go through these stages of pre-contemplation, called the stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparing for action, you take an action, and then you deal with maintenance, and then oftentimes you relapse a behavior, mm -hmm. right? I think the same thing can happen in violence, is that you pre-contemplate, oh, I'm so angry, I, I have all these emotional feelings, but I don't want to deal with it the way these people deal with it, right? I, I don't want to take this advice, I'm so angry, I start to rationalize my behavior that mm, maybe violence is okay, right? I'm contemplating that, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm thinking, and then for some people, it goes to the planning stages of an actual violent act, as we hear in the news. Uh, and for other people, uh, you know, such as shooting up a parade or a school, that was pre-planned almost every time. Where other people maybe have been contemplating violence kind of underneath the surface, and then the opportunity arises, they're angry, and they quote-unquote snap, okay? No, that didn't just happen. Because your average person, unless they're defending an innocent person, doesn't always, they don't jump into violence, right? Sure. Road rage also has a lead up, right. right? Maybe I'm unhappy about something at work. It's hot out. It's in Phoenix. I'm hot, you know, I maybe didn't think, boy, I'm going to get into road rage today, but there's other things not going well in my life. So this goes back to prevention. This hotline is prevention, but really there's a bigger conversation here. Are schools just a place where kids learn and get grades and go to college? Or is it a place where we need to work on students' emotional development and actually make whole classes on this? Um, how do we get along as peers? How do we have conversations? How do we resolve arguments? How do we have relationships? I don't know why that's not a required class in all United States schools, right? Um, because that is the stuff kids are dealing with, right? Uh, among other things. Um, and that education of how to express your emotions in a way that's healthy and not harmful to others is a skill. It's not something every teen is taught. It's not something every kid is taught. And, you know, we can't expect every parent to be able to give to their kids the emotional education that we maybe as a society believe should happen, right? It happens in a lot of places, but we can't be in denial of the fact that there are plenty of people out there that don't get the nurturing they need, they don't get the advice they need, they don't get the help they need. So what do we do with that? Do we just say, oh, well, they should have gotten help, and then we keep dealing with the people that they've harmed and blame it on the, the fact that their parents or the system or whatever it is? Or do we actually say, okay, there's a problem. We can't solve everybody's individual personal issue at home or at work or at school, but we can provide a resource where that is at least facilitating the possible engagement of that individual yeah yeah stepping in in a, in a place where as i think you already mentioned in the interview but i'm going to ask again just because i want to make sure that if this is taboo who who wants to say you know i'm feeling homicidal you know i would say it's very taboo uh, i think um that is because the taboo is because the culture has put a taboo on it. But I think people are fascinated by violence and homicide. What are the most popular TV shows besides romantic comedies and soap operas? They are violent shows. They're CSI, killer shows, all these sort of things. And people are interested in this, right? But it's the dark side of our thoughts. Mm -hmm. But every human is capable of violence if driven to that level. So, okay, so here's a little story. In... I think it was the 90s, before the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline was created, a lot of House members and senators didn't want to hear about it. A lot of officials didn't want to hear about it. Oh, those people, they're just mentally ill. Uh, we can't stop them. They just need to take personal responsibility and go see a therapist. Well, not everybody has the resources to find a therapist, to get to a therapist, to do those sort of things. Not everyone has health insurance. So, that, so they created this suicide hotline out of a bunch of other crisis lines, and they made a national number. And lo and behold, people started calling. 
and people started calling more. And every year it breaks records with the amount of people. And is it stopping all suicides? Of course not. But is it diminishing and is it decreasing the amount of suicides we're probably facing? Yes. And is it is it mitigating crises? Absolutely. So the violence hotline wouldn't stop violence, but it would give opportunities to those who don't have the resources or the know-how because it would be a simple hotline, perhaps even tied to the current 988 line, but it would be specifically dealing with their issue, which is I feel like I want to plan violence or I feel like I'm homicidal or I, I need to hurt somebody because I'm feeling hurt inside. I'm upset about something. I'm aggrieved about something. I am resentful about something. And oftentimes, people resolve that by talking it out, you know, arguments. They resolve it by moving jobs, moving schools, whatever they do. They, they resolve it by going to therapy. They resolve it with their spirituality. But there's a lot of people that don't know how to do that. So what do we do as a society? We, do we just wait for them to get arrested and then house them with our tax money? Or do we put our tax money into prevention? Sure. What would it take to make this this happen? To be able to make the National Violence Prevention Hotline a reality, it would take a number of things, but quite simply, any sort of government or private interest in this. That's it. Uh, a private group that wants to donate to our nonprofit, I'm certainly not going to run it. I would hire somebody with the expertise to do so. I have the idea. We have a board with lots of great ideas but we want to put it in the hands of efficiency, whether that's through our nonprofit or if a government agency wants to do a test pilot program in a state or a county, we'd be all for that. We, we would love to help that. So any government interest, any private equity interest, it does take somebody with means or clout to be able to get something like this started. The actual logistics of doing it are not that difficult. Here's why. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is funded, and they have call centers all over the U.S., all in different time zones. We aren't reinventing the wheel. We're either copying them or we're utilizing their staff to be specially trained on violence, and we're making an option for them to call. We aren't starting something from scratch necessarily. It's the idea and the focus that's different. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for people who, you know, have watched violence play out we see this a lot right no mm -hmm. matter what it what kind of violence it is um what would you want them to know about how this could step in how this could fill a gap that's already existing i think this fills a gap in a number of ways number one it starts the conversation that we need to normalize that violence is happening and quit being in denial of it and acting like we're all shocked every time we hear that hear it in the news it happens all the time it just doesn't always make the news it's not big enough of a story to make the news. Usually mass violence is making the news, right? But we've had hundreds of mass shootings, but not just the shootings, it's the violence that's happening every day that's pre-planned, right? So to fill in the gap, first of all, there isn't a resource. I've searched the internet, I've looked all over. There are some, of course, talk programs where you can go into a certain neighborhood and talk about gang violence, or there's anger support groups or there's different things like that, but they're all disparately located all over the U.S. There isn't a central location to necessarily go and reach the people that might offend. Oftentimes we're focused on the victims, but the victims have already been hurt. And that's good. We should focus and heal the victims. But what about the people that are potential offenders? we have the ability to reach them because right now they haven't committed the crime yet. They're still there. So it fills the gap by offering this resource, which could be low cost, to see what happens, right? We didn't think the suicide hotline would be as big as it is now. Senators and House members didn't even want to talk about it. We didn't even want to talk about mental health. What I think is going on with leadership is there's a lot of issues going on all over the country but there's a failure of imagination. We keep trying to do things the same way we've been doing them. And this program is imagining what would our society be like if there was a resource for violence. And then if that violence could focus not, you know, focus on people that are potential offenders, but also people that are victims to get them information, 
And then perhaps even starting up little programs in schools or in cities locally to get people engaged, not just on the phone. And I've also thought about, about it being an internet chat program. Um, another thing we've thought about is this. Once the program was started, utilizing ad money to advertise on the message boards where people that are violent are known to hang out. This is not rocket science. The FBI and the police know what chat rooms, most of them, where people that are very upset and angry and possibly potentially violent hang out on the internet. It's there. The research is there. We would put advertisements on there to maybe evoke some of them to get help, right? Um, it's, it's because I think as therapists, you see people who you never thought could change, change. People are able to change if they have the right resources and if they want to, right? So not everyone's going to want to, but what about all the people that could change? There's not the resource. So it would fill a gap of culturally the conversation needs to shift. We need to become adults as a, as a country and say, this is happening. Why don't we do something about it? That is utilitarian and makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this doesn't replace police officers. This doesn't replace safety officers. This doesn't replace school counselors. This doesn't replace the class I talked about perhaps um, going in. It doesn't replace anything. It's an addition. It's another idea that could broadly help. That's what I think. Is that answering what Absolutely, you were wondering? Yeah. yeah. Two last questions for yeah, you. Yeah, sure. It's very clear that you are very passionate about this. Yeah. Tell me why. I have many reasons why I'm passionate about this, but I think one of the main reasons is growing up in the United States where we have one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we have some of the smartest people in the world, we are one of the most innovative countries in modern history, and yet our social problems are out of control, um, our drug use is out of control, our, our violence rates are high, and other countries that would you know we would see as our peers aren't having the level of social problems we are having. So I feel that's a failure of investment by both private money and public money into preventative sources. And so as a person who is an expert in human behavior, when I see thousands of people dying every year, thousands more suffering because people are dying and thousands more being victims of violence. And then the people that are violent, of course, going to prison or dying themselves. And I say, this is a lot of this is preventable, right? It's not, we can't create a utopia, but there's a lot of prevention we could be doing as a society if we're investing in that, right? Um, we have the money. It's not lost on anybody that we have some money that it would take to run this thing. And what are the what are the cost benefits? The benefits are, um, you know, way less lost wages of people that are dead, way less trauma in our country, way less hospital visits. All of all of the all of these things are possible. So it just it personally bothers me that I don't feel like the solutions for violence are really that practical. They seem to be extremist, right? Um, here's a couple uh, uh, of the reactions I see in society. We need to give everybody guns so that if there's a violent person, we all shoot them. Or we need to take away all the guns so no one has any guns. N neither of these, they're both, they're both extreme. They don't deal, they're dealing with the tool of violence, but they're not dealing with the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knows about business, the, the, some of the most successful businesses that, that are getting on, you know, places people want to work, they deal with the emotional side of business, right? The companies that get on those lists where nobody wants to work and it's horrible, they don't care about the emotional side of the worker or the manager. So as a society, we focus so much on all our great technology and all our cool entertainment options and all, and all of the amazing things that the United States has to offer, but I don't think we focus on our social issues uh, seriously. And, and just look at the pay rates of therapists and social workers. Look at the disparity of teachers. I mean, we aren't investing in people. We're investing in really cool stuff that is optional for people that can afford it. You know, we have great entertainment options, but we aren't investing in people. I would add this. I would say 
I have a message for anyone who is of retirement age and has money and time. If you have money and you have time, please keep doing all your fun activities, but think about getting involved in this. It's not a political organization, but it's something that you could do to help the lives of other Americans. Uh, for anybody who is in the working ages, uh, get involved by going to the website of National Violence Prevention Hotline and writing your local representative or bringing it up at city council meetings or writing your senators about it. If anybody has any clout or private money, we would welcome that. We're a nonprofit, 501c3, and that would make a big difference. Uh, if you're a young person, you could also get involved by writing your congresspeople or really studying this in your university or figuring out what to do. So there's a lot of options to get involved, but nothing is going to happen with this hotline, I guarantee you, if it's just me and my board. We don't have a lot of money and we don't have clout. So we aren't even invested in keeping this idea to ourselves. If somebody wants to run it, if somebody's got the money to go for it, we're all about it. So we're just looking for collaborators in any way that you fit, see fit. If this means you share the National Violence Prevention Hotline on your social media, if it just means you get involved in your local school or city council and talk about violence, that's great. But everyone can share a role in this because it's happening. Yeah. It's happening out there every day. Thank you so yeah, much. You're welcome. Stay right there for me oh. just for a couple minutes just so I can get a couple of shots just to introduce you. Sure. Keep pretending I'm sitting over there okay. for me. Thank you so much yeah. for, for taking the time to, to talk about this. We thought it was so interesting, just the idea of stepping kind of before, yeah. you know, prevention and having a tool that is anonymous and something that, you know, people could really step into. Exactly. Find, you know? And it's actually aimed at people that are doing it instead of the victim. Right. Which yeah. is, I think, a huge shift. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to your point, you're like, we got to take care of the victim. Absolutely. But could we help on the front end? Too? Yeah. And like, that is huge. That is huge. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. When did you come up with the idea? The idea I came up with in 2018. And I wrote a paper on it and did a lecture. You can see it on YouTube. And then it evolved from there. And I got collaborators in the last three or four years and started the nonprofit. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or take just a minute to give us a rating on iTunes. As most of you know, I am passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. My colleagues and I have started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding and collaborators so that we can start a 24 7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to save lives and curb violence by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence, help to de escalate them and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website, www.violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us online by signing our petition on the website, sharing the website with your network of people, Donating to the cause if you like, and you can now even write your congressperson from our website with a simple form. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are a therapist looking for ethical and excellent medical billing services, check out therapistbillingservicesllc.com. That's www.therapistbillingservicesllc.com. Billing services created by therapists for therapists. 
If you're looking for an EMDR International Association consultant, I am a consultant and I can provide you the 20 hours you need to become EMDRIA certified. I have groups online and in person and I do individual consultation. Just send me a message at the website and I'll get back to you. If you want to get trained in EMDR therapy, check out the great training opportunities with EMDR Training Solutions. I've worked with them before and they are phenomenal, so register today. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment at a local counseling center in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest. And while these are based on the literature they have read and the experience in their fields, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you're in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. You can also text 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org? You can order from the comfort of your own home online while supporting local brick and mortar businesses near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your national or local therapy organizations such as the American Counseling Association or the American Mental Health Counselors Association, please get involved. At least pay the dues. It will help the lobbyists in our field keep us from becoming gig workers. And of course, there's the bonus of increasing mental health education around the United States and helping people understand what counseling is and promoting best practices within our profession. Until next time, I wish you all a safe and peaceful week. Mm-hmm.